I tell people that all the time that recognition is not just explicit, expressed, you know, memory, you know, just because they can't say, I'm pointing at you, I know your name and I know you're my daughter. It doesn't mean that they're not feeling it. The emotional memory and the, just the sense of safety that people will feel. You can tell they relax. Um, there will be people so deep along the dementia journey, but their daughter comes and you can see they just kind of like lean. They just lean on them. And that's just so overlooked in our understanding of dementia. Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living Podcast. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. I created this podcast to give you inspiration and let you know you're not alone in feeling stuck in midlife. I also invite you to join the Age Agitators Club for Women, where we come together monthly to hatch our plans for making waves as we age. Being part of this community for women will remind you on a regular basis that you're not too old and it's never too late to do that thing you've been thinking about. You can find more information at latebloomerliving.com forward slash community, and I hope to see you there. Hello, my friend. Oh, my goodness. Can I tell you how excited I am to have today's guest on? Uh, what we're going to talk about today is something that has been kind of central to my life and I think has been a big part of what I fear about getting older. And I have some personal experience within the last 10 years that plays into this, but I think it goes way back into everything that we absorb as people from general cultural conversations. And that is the topic of dementia. I have definitely always been afraid of that mental decline. I'm also been afraid of physical decline too. Anything that would make me less than independent has been something that made me fear aging more than death, truly. So I have with me today Emerson Lee, who is a dementia readiness coach, who talks about the fear of dementia and how to prepare yourself so that maybe there's less fear around it. And even if you do get it, maybe you're a little more prepared to be able to manage it. Your loved ones can be more prepared to help manage this thing. So that's what I want to talk to Emerson about today. Uh, Emerson is trained as a certified dementia practitioner, also an end-of-life doula. And I just can't wait to dig into this because I think this is just so important. And I don't think I'm alone in my fears. So Emerson, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for that vulnerable introduction. I love that you shared your fears because you are right that it, it's almost universal. Um, the fear is so, so common. So I love you starting off saying I'm scared and you might be too. Um, that's a really powerful place to start. Yeah. And what I referred to ever so briefly uh, as my personal experience is uh, my father had dementia. He just passed away a few weeks ago and it was the long goodbye. That's what they call it, right? It was 10 years of watching him go away and uh, it was really hard. And I, and I was long distance. So my mom, who is 81 years old herself. He was 90 when he passed. She is working still at a job, at a job job, you know, and is his primary caregiver at the same time. And I do not know how she's done it. They live in Arizona. I live in Connecticut. I've been very little help to her on a day-to-day -day basis. And I don't know how the lady has kept the balls in the air. It's been nuts. And I think, though, that we overestimate the, at least from what I understand, the statist statistically, we overestimate our likelihood of getting dementia or having to deal with that. Is is that true? I I think that, yes, it is true that kind of everyone assumes it's going to happen to them and a much smaller proportion of people actually experience it. Um so yes, we're, we're overestimating our risk. Oftentimes it's a magnified fear. The other thing I'd say too, is we overestimate our, our misery if it happens. Um, that's one of the things that I experienced in memory care was 
I started working there and I was like, these people are having a good time. Like we're enjoying our time together. They love sitting and having coffee, sitting outside in the sun. They love singing and, you know, sitting, you know, eating a good meal. Um, So I think hand in hand, you know, you may not get it. And if you get it, it may not be as much of a complete and total 24 seven misery that we think it is. Um, So I find a lot of comfort in that, that maybe we won't get it. If we do, there also may be hope there um, that those statistics look better for us than we think they do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Because I have witnessed what you've seen being in the care provider position I've witnessed it personally through my husband's aunt and my dad. They were, they're pretty happy that like, I didn't feel like my dad was suffering necessarily until, until the end. Um, But he was a pretty happy guy overall. And yeah, there, I think there were some moments of frustration that you could see. Um, And my, my husband's aunt early on, there was a lot of paranoia built into her journey and, and frustration. And, you know, so, but then she got to a point where she, and I don't know if that's because of medication that they put her on, but she got to the point where she, once she was settled in a care facility, that was a great, I mean, it was an amazing place. We're very lucky that she had saved enough money to, to be able to go there. And that place took such good care of her. And we went and visited her and, At first, she hated to see us leave and she wanted to go home. But once she made the transition to feeling like that place was home, that became much easier too. Is that what you see generally with people who land in care? Yeah, I do see that, that um, there's kind of often a transition. We think that early stages is better and later stages is worse. But some people in the early stages, they are more paranoid. They are more kind of like what's going on here. Um, Then they transition into a different setting and into maybe a deeper stage. And, you know, there's a bit more acceptance of like, okay, this is what's happening. Um, I think sometimes it's hard for people to have one world, one, one foot in, you know, the quote unquote real world and one foot in dementia land, as some people living with it call it. And sometimes when they do step you know, into dementia land, they're in a memory care community, they are settled, they feel safe, especially like you're saying, if it's a community that makes them feel safe, it can be a huge shift and a huge change that is often better. So I sometimes tell people when I talk to people in early stages and their loved ones who are having a really bad time, I say sometimes it is actually, it'll actually feel better to you. You'll actually feel more joy, more connection a little bit later on, um, which is so counterintuitive to what we think. We think it's just going to steadily get worse the entire time. But yeah, it is. I've I've witnessed that a lot. Yeah. What What do you think? What's to be done about it? What How do How do you prepare yourself for, uh, you know, without worrying yourself to death over it? it? I mean, that's kind of what you're specializing guys specializing in, right? Is helping people prepare in some way for the possibility they could get dementia, maybe without going crazy about it? Yeah, that's a very good summary of what I do. And I I always tell people it's weird how fun my work is. Like it's really fun stuff. One of the biggest things I talk about is documenting your preferences. So I wanna know how do you take your coffee and what, like, where did you grow up? Like, are you close to your hometown? Does that make you feel happy to talk about? What are the names of the dogs you've had? The, you know, the music, music is huge. You know, what music were you listening to between the ages of 10 and 30? There's literally an infinite amount of information that I can have about a person and that can make their day better. Um, That's what I did in memory care every single day. You know, I was spending time with different people, you know, I'd be playing this song or I'd be getting them this snack, or I knew they liked to sit outside. So that knowing that information about yourself and sharing it with your loved ones and saying, Hey, if I could dementia don't treat me like a stranger who none of this matters to you know build these into my day and that's going to be better for you and better for them Um, and it can continue like it can help you deepen and continue your bond and those things are really deeply embedded in our long-term memory Um, like I said especially music but you know the foods we've always eaten the places we've always known they really do stick around Um, we have this idea that we just will have nothing and there's actually so much that's still deep in our brain 
Um, so that's one of my favorite ones. And it's fun. You know, people love to talk about that. Um, they love to think through like, oh, what was I doing when I was 10 years old? And it brings up those feelings and you can see their eyes light up. Um, that's just the biggest and most fun stuff, I think. And there's a lot of other fun things too, things like making a playlist. Um, yeah, there's a lot. That's great. You know, when I, when my dad, uh, gosh, this is probably, I think it was 2022. So where are we in? So it was two years ago. He was pretty far along, but he was still in a zone at that point where he was much more in tune with his younger years than he was with current day. He could, he would talk, like I could get him to start talking about where he grew up and when he was in the army, which was like in the 1950s after the Korean War, he was stationed in Japan. I ended up turning on the little recording function on my phone while I was out to lunch with him visiting one day. And I have stories from him. And I, it was later, I wish I had done it sooner, actually, but it, it's still great to have his voice, his personality come through and talk about what he was doing at that younger point in his life, which he just seemed to be able to access better than anything else. And I learned some stuff about my dad. And the funny thing is, is that the whole time I'm kind of like, is this even true? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how much of this is true, but but that's what he was remembering at that point, you know? Yeah. I love storytelling in dementia. It's I, I, everyone I've ever worked with has the stories that they tell. And like you're saying, sometimes you're like, Hmm, did this happen or not? Sometimes they're, um, the story happened, but they exaggerate it. Like one gentleman always told us that his wife met the queen of England. And she was actually like, she was a person in the government who like met important people, but to him that became like the queen of England. Um, so it keeps the, it kind of keeps the story, you know, keeps the meaning of it, but the stories, you know, you, you never know what someone's going to tell you, what's going to become important. You know, I had one lady tell us over and over about this horse that meant so much to her. My dad she, too. My, my yeah. dad's father was a milkman who delivered the milk in bottles in a horse, oh, you know, horse drawn coach. And the horse was my, my dad loved that horse and used to ride a horse when he was young. My dad's not an outdoors guy. So I was like, what? You rode a horse? You took care of a horse? Really? Cool. You know? I love that. And it's, it's funny because some of those stories you don't hear until their brain kind of unlocks them. I know some people have learned a lot about their loved ones on the dementia journey. Um, they've found out different stories. Yet again, sometimes not knowing if they're true or not. Sometimes they can verify them. But yeah, storytelling, both factual storytelling, and then also you can just kind of play around with storytelling and improvise with people and come up with some really fun scenarios. Like I created a story with a bunch of people living with dementia about this owl who lived in a library and his name was Who. And that was that was all their idea. Yeah, storytelling is definitely one I like to tell people about that, you know, factual or fun, um, or factual and fun. It is a, it's a cool thing to explore with people. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's such a mystery, isn't it? Yeah. Like, like truly, like my husband's aunt, she was she was a Rhodes Scholar. She was a world traveler. She didn't get married until she was in her 50s. She was a very independent, thoughtful, smart woman. And I think that's why she struggled so much in the beginning against, against it. But, you know, we'd go and ask her after she was in the care facility for a while, we'd you'd go and say, you know, what'd you do today? And she said, oh, I was so busy. We had meetings and we had, and in her mind, she had been at work all day. You know, yeah. she, she had been, she was still working. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I, yeah. I love, so one of the things I, I talk about too, storytelling is one also that it's almost like a time machine. Um, I encourage people to conceptualize dementia more like a, a time machine. Um, that you are kind of time traveling and you will think that you were at work and to you that is completely real and you have the fulfillment of a hard day's work or you have the fulfillment of sitting in grandma's kitchen um, eating her food again um, you know people reach a stage where they think that their husband is alive again and that they are spending time with him mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different ways that they are you know they're not in the like rational present with us but they are somewhere that's meaningful to them um, and that, you know, as a personal aside on that, I've thought about that. My um, sweet soul dog recently died. 
Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, and yeah, it was, it was, um, it's been really interesting exploring our bond and how it's continuing. Um, and I genuinely hope that I see him again. I hope that I time travel to him. Um, you know, we do sometimes see our pets and our loved ones at the very end of life, whether we have dementia or not, um, as an end of life doula, you know, just in the dying process. Um, but dementia can be extended. You might spend quite a bit of time with a loved one who's gone. Um, and yeah, I think sometimes that can be a comfort to be like, oh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll see them again. Yeah. My husband looks a lot like his father. And so very often his aunt would think that he was his dad, you know, yeah. and even then towards the end, when she got less verbal, um, you know, she, she had long since not had no idea who we were, like, couldn't, couldn't say our names, but you could see recognition in her eyes. It's gonna, it's gonna make me cry. Um, you could see that when she saw us show up, she was delighted, you know, and I could see that in my dad too. In the end, I was like, does he know I'm me? I don't know, but I know he loves me. Yep. I can feel that and I still get that from him or got that from him. I love that you had that experience. There are a lot of people who don't notice that the recognition's there. And I think that's so devastating on both sides of it that the person isn't being yeah. recognized for their recognition. And then the other person is feeling like they're not seen. And I, I tell people that all the time that recognition is not just explicit, expressed, you know, memory you know, just because they can't say, I'm pointing at you, I know your name, and I know you're my daughter, it doesn't mean that they're not feeling it. The mm -hmm. emotional memory and the, just the sense of safety that people will feel, you can tell they relax. Um, there will be people so deep along the dementia journey, but their daughter comes and you can see they just kind of like lean, they just lean on them. And that's just so overlooked in our understanding of dementia that people are still experiencing each other, even if they can't express it. Yeah. Thank Gosh. you for sharing with both your aunt and your dad. Yeah. Yeah. I think the disease is harder on the people caring for people with dementia who, who are family members, who are loved ones than it is for the person with dementia. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm right. <laughs> it's just my personal experience of what I've seen. They, they just seemed pretty darn happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, and that's such an interesting dynamic. I love that you bring it up because a lot of people are pretty happy, and they're we may assume they're suffering, but they're they're often not. Um, and that's one of the things I have been exploring with people is processing their loved ones' experience, but then also their own too. Um, and one of the biggest things I bring up with that is continuing bonds and maintaining connection, because um, mm -hmm. I think the biggest amount of suffering that we have is that our society tells us that they're gone and you can't connect with them anymore. Um, and we we really kind of teach people like, if you're a person with dementia, if, if you love someone with dementia, you know, you have to let them go. They're, they're gone, they're a stranger. Um, and finding ways to keep that bond. Um, and as an end of life doula, we continue bonds even after death. So even if someone is passed on, we still have a connection with them and we can still um, hold their memory and you know, talk to them or hold space for them in our lives. Um, and I think that helps bridge that gap for people when a loved one's still alive that, you know, we, if we maintain the bond, the suffering lessens a lot. Can you explain that a little bit more for me? I'm not sure I totally get that. The continuing bonds. Yeah. 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 So I'll start with the end of life concept of it and the grief concept. So in grief traditionally, or maybe not traditionally, but recently in American history, we have said, when you are grieving someone, you need to move on. You need to say goodbye, move on. And that is what's healthy is to, to mm -hmm. let them go. Mm -hmm. And there's a realm in the grief world that's gained a lot more traction, which says this person was, and is, and always will be important to you. And your grief journey is not about letting them go or moving on. It's about integrating. You've had this loss and feeling the pain and sobbing and, you know, reorienting your life around this pain, but also recognizing that there's still that bond and that relationship. And so continuing bonds, we do it naturally as humans. That's why we have memorial services and memorial items and why we have altars in our homes. It's something we do that our brains 
thrive on saying this person's still here. I'm still holding space for them. I'm still loving them. Um, so that's in the end of life and grief world. And with dementia, we do the same thing. We say, you know, they have dementia. They're not themselves anymore. You have to let them go, but they are still there. And there are ways to connect with them. And we do better when we see more connection than disconnection. People who are suffering the most in it are the ones who are thinking, I shouldn't visit my mom because she won't remember me. That's a really, really painful place to be as opposed to maybe I can send her a postcard from her hometown or a video call or go see her. And even if she doesn't remember me, we had ice cream together. Um, so con applying continuing bonds to dementia is a huge part of what I do. And I love to talk about it. So if you have any other questions. I oh, yeah. Ta ta give me examples and or um, if you have stories that stand out for you that are particular, you know, favorites, I would love to hear about yeah. that. Yeah, I think some of the favorite things that I've seen people do is form new rituals with their loved one um, that aren't dependent on cognitive abilities. So, you know, seeing a daughter visit her mom and they walk around the building and sing German folk songs that, you know, the mom used to sing to the daughter. Now the daughter sings to the mom. You know, they're still connecting. They still have that bond of, you know, we're German. We speak German. We sing German songs but they're doing it in a new ritual and that that isn't you know dependent on verbal communication or explicit memory it's very deeply ingrained you know holding hands walking and singing are all very procedural memory but very deep parts of ourselves so things like that i've seen a lot of and people just carrying the memories of their loved ones that you know even if this person can't remember that they were you know a mailman giving them the mail and, you know, letting them sort through the mail, things like that, that we are finding ways to say, you know, this is who you are as the person. And I still see that. And I'm still interacting with that in that way. I have so, so many stories like that. I've just seen so many different situations, but that's, that's the kind of the gist of it is identifying something that you share um, and something that's important to that person and then adapting it to still be in their lives. Mm. That's beautiful. I'm thinking about the last, um, I was, I was out to see my dad in November when things were looking like at that point, like he might be going and, and he, he rebounded. And while I was there, um, my mom pulled out, this is the first time that she'd done this. She pulled out a deck of cards. And at this point she had him in a wheelchair and she had bought a tray table. Cause he, before that he had been mostly in bed. So she'd been feeding him on the tray table in bed, but we moved it into the living room and something about the cards really worked in that and that he would just place them, you know, and it kept him, it kept him busy and kind of occupied. There was no rhyme or reason to what he was doing that we could see, you know, or, and then we would move things and, you know, kind of move things around and shuffle and talk to him. And it, he, he got engaged with that right, right up to the end right up That's, to the end. Yeah. I love the concept of like playing games with people. And even if they're not doing it like the right way, you know, just letting them the, the familiarity of cards, especially for older generations, there was a lot more just like sitting around and playing cards and just being in that space, letting them kind of do that. I've done that with some people and you can tell that it feels familiar and it, it, yeah, like like you're saying, it engages them. They're like, oh yeah, we're doing something. I wonder if my generation, you know, I was in the first generation, I'm Gen X, right? And and we were like the first ones with video games, you know, the really, the 8-bit Pac-Man and, uh, you know, I wonder if um, if somebody goes down the dementia road, you know, I when I would go, what am I trying to get to? When we would go to visit John's aunt in, in the home that she was in, they mostly had a bunch of different little sitting areas around and sometimes they would do music with them. There were more active things that they would do with them, but, but something that was kind of a stalwart was they'd have a, an old movie playing, you know, and a lot of them would be gathered around sitting on a sofa or in their chair or whatever, watching these old movies. And now I'm wondering, Hmm, for the Gen Xers, are they going to put out like video games and you sit around I would with a joystick in your hand and it's like second nature? And I would expect that to be a great addition to, yeah, our nursing homes in the future. Uh, that's so yeah. funny. 
Hey, we're going to take a quick break here so I can tell you about an awesome resource that I think you're going to love. Here's the thing. We are always works in progress. Do you find yourself wondering, what do I want to be when I grow up? If so, then I think you're going to want to subscribe to We're All Getting Older, which is a weekly newsletter written by Lou Blazer that's all about continuing to grow and get better in the second half of our lives. We're All Getting Older is a sponsor for this podcast, and I'll tell you, I don't choose sponsors lightly. I get so much benefit from reading Lou's newsletter every week, and I think you will too. She writes the newsletter for midlifers who believe in getting better as we get older and making the most of life's second half. Her newsletter was previously called Midlife Cues, but it does have a shiny new name and I love it. We're all getting older. So if you want to subscribe to that, it is on Substack and you can easily find a link to subscribe at lublazer.com. That's L-O-U-B-L-A-S-E-R dot com. And now back to our regularly scheduled programming. I've heard of, of places doing like fake weddings. And did you guys ever do anything like that where you worked we, or? You know, I wanted to do so much more. We were really under resourced and understaffed, but I tried to do many versions of that. Like one of my things I did during COVID was, um, I turned on a Disneyland parade onto the TV and then I made like really fun ice cream sundaes. So it was really actually like a really fun day. Like it felt like Disneyland. Yeah. The sing-alongs were very fun to be there for, you know, to watch people, you know, some, some participated more than others, but you could see a general enjoyment, even in the people who weren't participating, you know, or in actually singing, um, you could kind of see maybe a glint in their eye or something that, Sometimes I love to see just the tiniest toe tap, mm. you know, you think someone's just sitting there and then you look down at their feet and they're, they're tapping. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, wow. 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 I always tell people that too. That's another thing is, um, you know, we think, oh, I won't be able to kind of like dance and do all this stuff anymore. But I've seen people at every single stage interact with music. Like you're saying, sometimes just a glint in their eye, but you know, sometimes dancing just becomes kind of grabbing someone's hand and, you know, moving it back and forth. Um, but that's still a kind of dancing and you could still see people really enjoying it. Yeah. So the work that you do is, I mean, so much that we see in health and wellness articles or people who work in health and wellness is about prevention. What can you do to prevent it? What Are we doing crossword puzzles? Are we learning a new language? What What are the things that we can do to keep those neural connections going, Right. But that's not the work you're doing. You're doing more of the emotional preparation work. Mm -hmm. How yeah. can somebody do this? How how does one prepare emotionally for you know dealing with this fear? Yeah, I I landed on the term readiness, and that felt really right because for a while I was like, how do I express this? But it, yeah, the the readiness of if this happens, I feel more ready. Um, and also if it doesn't happen too, like documenting your preferences, connecting with your loved ones, that's great to do regardless. So I always tell people that even if you don't get it, it's still great preparations. Um, but yeah, that shift between prevention and readiness, um, often prevention, you know, it's very well-intentioned. We want to avoid this thing, but it's still anxiety and based it's inherently anxiety based, um, and readiness can often be empowering to people because they're saying, whether it happens or not, you know, I'm not fighting it. I'm not resisting it. I recognize it could, I have clients who are like, oh yeah, I'm definitely going to get it. You know, I've seen every family member get it. I'm going to get it. There's just kind of this acceptance of like, yeah, I'm going to get it. If I don't get it, great. <laughs> you know, and I think that shift can help. Um, it can be really liberating. I've seen people who have dementia saying I have to do my crossword because if I do my crossword, then I can go home and I can live alone again. And that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the devastating things about prevention is you don't try you don't stop trying to prevent it once you've already gotten it. Um, there are people deep in dementia buying hundreds of dollars worth of memory supplements to try to make it stop. Um, so readiness is something that can ease that where you can be present where you're at and say, you know, I, I love seeing people living with dementia say, I know that I have this condition. 
I know that this is happening to me and I'm still enjoying life. I'm still connecting. I think the biggest step for that, um, cause you were saying, how, how do we do that? I think the biggest step is knowing that it's possible. We really haven't presented that as an option to people. Like you're saying, pretty much everywhere you go, it's all about prevention. It's all about risk factors. And is there going to be a cure or a treatment? Um, what's the likelihood I'm going to get it? But there is a whole world of people who are, um, the, the phrase people tend to use is living well with dementia, um, advocates living well with dementia. Um, if you Google like advocates living with dementia, there's a whole world of people doing advocacy around it. And um, just hearing their stories, knowing what, how they're dealing with it, following their lead. Um, my practice is really based on learning from them. I've kind of shaped everything around what are they saying? Um, and a lot of them aren't saying, oh, dear God, get a treatment right now to make this stop. A lot of them are saying, hey, treat me like a person and keep spending time with me. I think that helps people once they realize that that's a possibility. Yeah. I saw on your uh, website that you are a member of Reimagining Dementia, which is a creative coalition for justice. Can you speak to what that group does? Yes. If you want to connect with people who are living well with dementia, that is such a powerful group of people. So it's um, I think we're close to a thousand members now around the whole world. I think it's like something like 30 countries. And it's basically just a bunch of people, a really casual, you know, grassroots group of people saying, we can do this differently. We can see people's humanity. We can find ways to be with them and doing it in really creative ways. There's a lot of activists and artists and, you know, there's professionals in non-traditional care homes who are trying different approaches. There's just all sorts of different things happening there. And some of my favorite, favorite people are doing work there. One of my favorite things to share with people is um, the song. If you go to reimaginingdementia.com, we created a song. Uh, we have a lot of musicians and writers and uh, we collect collectively collaborated to create the lyrics, um, to do some choreography. People um, sent in uh, photos and videos of people. So when you watch it, you see people deep in the stages of dementia who are dancing and laughing and smiling and holding babies. And it really, those, I think it's a five to seven minute video. Those five to seven minutes can say so much about this. It um, sounds wonderful. Right. It sounds really great. I've got to go look. And so cool. you mentioned an alternate care home, alternate care home. Can you, can you speak a little bit more to what that is? Because I, I, I just have to say our, our current system is so, so broken it's, it's so broken. As as I said, my my husband's aunt, you know, she was a school teacher. It's not like she ever made a ton of money, but I guess she invested her money well and she had a good pension and she had enough to be in a really nice place for the last, I, I want to say, 10 years of her life. Um, on the other hand, my parents fell into this mid-range where they weren't poor enough to get Medicaid didn't make enough to get real good at home care or put my dad someplace that was that felt safe that where my mom felt like yes he's going to be cared for here um what gosh i mean ah, are there alternatives <laughs> yeah that's something that's so heavy on my heart i worked in memory care during covid and that's actually why i became an end of life doula i was present with someone who died and it just redirected my path into being an end-of-life doula in a private practice because, yeah, the system, especially the for-profit nature of the system, just seeing, you know, them trying to pack the rooms and not following protocols and not treating people the way they should be treated. It's, it, I, I have legitimate trauma from it that I'm still kind of processing. I'm planning on writing probably a book about it. So yeah, that's something I feel very deeply and it, it feels small compared to the vastness of the system, but there is a movement. There is a movement for um, home and community-based care is kind of the acronym they use, HCBS, I think. Um, but there's different models of home and community-based care. So there's, I think in the UK, they call them butterfly homes, if I recall correctly. And they're very designed to support the personhood of, you know, to, to see that person and to support them and help them feel safe. Really any model that is, set on their safety and helping them feel, you know, not just physically safe and restrained, because there's a lot of that in our current system of sit down, you're a fall risk, you know, don't, don't move, don't do anything. Yeah. Um, but also emotionally safe. Um, I saw so little of that in memory care of making someone feel 
feel safe. We don't, we're not training our staff um, on that because the system's so burdened, you know, people are, you know, don't have enough time between the residents to be able to help them feel that safe. Um, but there is, there, there are changes happening. And anytime I hear about different models like that, it's a bomb to my soul because we, we do need that. And it is moving forward. More and more people recognize the need for it. And it is um, slowly but surely getting there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it w- I guess my question to myself is what can I do to get more involved or what kind of advocacy, you know, cause I feel strongly about it now, you know, yeah. having, having seen what my parents went through, it's like, yeah. nobody should have to. Yeah. 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 It's, um, it's hard for me to think about the system that I was in and knowing that it's still there that it is still standing and going strong. I love being in private practice and doing what I can to empower people outside of the system. Um, one of the things about documenting preferences, I tell people, you know, that's something you can bring in with you. That's a tool that can help your care team know you better and treat you better. Um, mm-hmm. They'll have more to work with. Um, so I, I love doing that, but it's it's still hard. It almost feels like I got off of a like sinking, burning ship and I'm having to, you know, see it still going down um yeah it's uh, hanging on to the hanging on to a piece of ice next to the titanic exactly (laughs) that's what i'm imagining we could have gotten more people in these lifeboats (laughs) (laughs) yeah wow well i mean i don't want to end it on that note um (laughs) because that's just awful (laughs) yeah I, I i can add something hopeful about that too please um there is a term that i want to explore more of and i I haven't partially because of my own trauma. Part of my brain like can't fully go there. Um, nursing home abolition. There is a movement of people who are saying how we're doing nursing homes isn't is safe or sane for people. And so as far as activism and how to get involved for people, a lot of people who have seen those experiences and felt them really deeply that activism is a really powerful place. Um, I know even just the groups that I follow and the books I've read on it, things like that, it's just comforting to know other people are are tackling it too. Nursing home abolition is the the term that kind of, that's the rabbit hole that helped me find some more resources for that. Interesting. And but, is there a particular community or, or, or a dot .org or anything like that that you have found that is there working is, there? There isn't. I can't remember it right now. Let me, okay. let me see if I can find it real quick. Yeah. And if you send it to me after the fact, even I can make sure to put something in the show notes, anything that you think would be a good resource for anybody who's listening right now, if you don't mind, just send me, send me some stuff and I will, I'll have your vetted list of, yeah. of things that people can look at if they're interested in going down a rabbit hole as, as I always seem to be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm a rabbit hole kind of girl. <laughs> yeah, I love rabbit holes. Reimagining dementia is probably the best one I can recommend for that. Um, they don't use that term as much, but that is essentially how they were born. Um, the group started during COVID as a way of saying there's got to be a better way to do this, mm-hmm. um, especially when people were quarantined inside homes and not able to see their loved ones. So they they are working from that same heart and that same drive. And then they are, because they're global and know so many organizations and they vet those organizations, they're able to send people to different places. That's actually how I found out about a lot of this is people would say, oh, have you talked to this person about this? Um, they're doing this kind of work with nursing homes. There's a whole web there. There's a, there's rabbit holes there. And is the wor- are they working with the World Health Organization in any way, shape or form? Is there any kind of advocacy partnership going on? I'm not sure because they're still so small. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a growing movement, um, but it is still pretty small. And that's one of the biggest struggles with the coalition is how do we get ourselves onto a bigger um, platform? We've done a lot of press, a lot of talking with newspapers and news stations and organizations and podcasts. I've been on um, some of the podcasts with them. Yeah, it's a kind of big marketing campaign and most of us aren't marketing people. So the the video is actually part of that. The video was our way of saying, here's what we're trying to do share it far and wide. Um, 
so I'm not sure how far up we've gotten, but uh, hopefully we'll get to the World Health Organization soon. <laughs> I hope so. And they are becoming more aware of really just the problem of ageism as um, as a health issue. Because, you know, in my 40s, I, I meant to mention this earlier, in my 40s, when I was really kind of in the depths of probably perimenopause and I don't know what else was going on, I was beating myself up with this ageism bat is kind of how I refer to it now. And like, if I would misplace my phone or my keys or whatever, I would joke around, oh, I'm having a senior moment, you know? And I think that, you know, you do that to 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 laugh, but those jokes solidify this internalized ageism, which affects our health. And the World Health Organization is starting to see with the work of Becca Levy and other studies that have been done that this idea and this fear that goes around the whole idea of aging, which includes being afraid of dementia and that mental decline, it actually, you know, affects your health. You start activating the genes that are there because of the way you're thinking about it. And uh, so it's all really important that we become aware of our fear and try to try to rein it in a little bit. Yeah. I love that you brought attention to that because I see that a lot. One of the hardest things for me to witness is internalized ageism in someone in their 80s and 90s where they're saying, well, I'm just worthless and, you know, aging sucks and no one cares. And, you know, what does it matter? And they're not oriented because of society's messages. They're not oriented towards like, I still matter and I'm still living my life. And some people are, and you can see the ones who are thrive and the ones who aren't suffer because they, they keep themselves in that kind of like, you know, that kind of Eeyore mindset, not, you know, it's not their fault. It's society's, um, yeah. but that you like, you know, oh, well, and um, that's really hard to see in people. And I, I want to see more and more people say like, no, 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 I'm still kicking, you know, I'm in my eighties, I'm in my nineties, I'm still living my life. Um, that's a really fun thing to see with people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I will, I will have a link to the video that you talked about. And if you get me some, some resources for activism that we might be able to tap into, or just some research, I will be sure to put all those things in the show notes. And how do people find you Emerson? Yeah, there's two places that are the best for me. One is on Instagram at Let's Make Moments. And the other is I offer something called Love Letters to Your Brain. So my my mailing list is set up in a format where it's designed to be really affirming and share things that make your brain feel good and supported and loved. So um, both Let's Make Moments and Love Letters to Your Brain are kind of my, my two places. Very cool. Well, I'm going to go sign up for that because <laughs> yeah. who doesn't want love letters to their brain yeah. really? <laughs> when I thought of the idea it's almost like it's like from my brain to other people so it feels like love letters to my own brain too I was like this just feels good it feels good to write love letters and give love to all of our brains I love it well thank you so much for being with me today and for for talking about this subject which is just it's a big hairy <laughs> it's a big hairy what? scary thing isn't it it's a monster yeah. in the closet as yep. it were, but I guess it doesn't need to be. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Boy, uh, you know, I, I recorded this episode with Emerson not too long after my dad died. That was at the end of the year. Uh, he passed away on December 28th of 2023. And here it is early April already. Time flies doesn't it? I guess this thing, dementia, that I think we all fear, like the boogeyman in the closet or under the bed, really the numbers do show that people are not getting dementia in the numbers that they used to. And that really statistically, you're not as likely to get it as you may feel like you are likely to get it. And I also want to point out this, this mind-body connection where fear can trigger genetics to go into action. We are our own placebo. I, I do believe that. And uh, maybe I'm overstating it, but I'm, I'm just, I'm drawing a line in the sand. This fear of aging that um, I don't think I'm alone in is internalized ageism. 
pure and simple. And the World Health Organization is truly starting to take this seriously and look at it as a health issue. And I hope you will too. Start questioning what you really believe about what it means to get older. I'm going to leave you with that for today. How's that? I do want to invite you. Today is a gathering for the Age Agitators Club. It's not too late for you to come join. Try it out for your free month. Send me an email, latebloomerliving at gmail.com or go to the website. There's a page there where you can check it out, see what it's all about and sign up if you want to for the free month. And that's at latebloomerliving.com forward slash community. I'm also going to have resources for you and information about Emerson so that you can get in touch with them after the fact here and get more information. I think information is power. Information can help us to manage the fear around this thing. There you have it. I'll see you next week. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end. Stay safe and well and talk soon. Bye-bye.